Now, the panel discussion this afternoon is on the topic of personal Bible study. And uh, you have the outline in your little handout. Hopefully, everyone has one. You don't need me to just read it to you. But in terms of format, uh, what I intend to do is, as briefly as I can, just go through the questions that are here, the why, who, when, where, and how. Um, and then the time that we have together is actually going to be spent considering nine questions. I emailed around a number of people, uh, brothers and sisters, men and women, uh, that I have confidence in, I explained the purpose of the study and asked for some questions. And so I've compiled nine questions, divided them up among Sandy and Joseph and myself, and we will be touching on these points. But rather than just go through the outline again, uh, we will be touching on all of the various points on the outline through the format of answering specific questions. So we'll read just two references at the beginning, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 is a personal exhortation from Paul to Timothy, but it is applicable beyond the initial uh, context. It says, Study or be diligent to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, there's a few things you can see just from the, the language used in that verse. First of all, in terms of the first word, study, the idea is to be diligent. It takes effort. It's something we should seriously approach. It's something which is going to require deliberate, conscious focus and effort. We are to be diligent to show ourselves approved unto God. The word workman again, has the idea of effort or work or diligence, and it actually goes a little beyond just the effort involved to the, if you think of a workman, uh, a craftsman. It has the idea of moving forward with a certain amount of skill, a certain amount of acquired skill and knowledge to accomplish a purpose. A workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, and then the final expression, rightly dividing the word of truth, I think should be a little bit of a, a warning to us, um, that it's possible, in fact, the very fact that it's necessary to be exhorted to, to rightly divide the word of truth is a pretty strong indication that there's a real danger in not rightly dividing the word of truth, incorrectly interpreting and understanding the word of truth. Then let's turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. A very simple language. That means that the Scripture is profitable for all of those reasons given in order that the man or woman of God, the person serving God, will have everything they need completely furnished unto all good works. So the Word of God is the resource that contains everything needed for us to understand God and the revelation of God and His purpose for us in serving Him. That's a very broad paraphrase of the meaning of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 17. So very quickly in terms of why. Why is personal Bible study important? For a lot of the history of the church, personal Bible study was a bit of a misnomer because the Bible was not available in the common language of the people. And for many, many centuries, it was uh, not something that people had much of a personal opportunity to do but it was always the Lord's intention that people would study His Word, that they would learn what He had to say, that they would be attentive to the message of the revealed written Word of God. So I've just listed there a number of Scripture references. You can look them up on your own. Matthew 4 and verse 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So why should we seek to study our Bibles? Because it is the absolutely essential source of spiritual food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Psalm 119, 105 
says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we should study our Bibles because that is how the Lord will show us where we are and how he will guide us forward in his purposes in our life. 2 Timothy 3 and 16, we have read. Why should we study our Bibles? Because the Scripture is profitable, and it is the means through which God is going to furnish us or equip us in our service for Him. Psalm 119 and verse 11, we should study our Bibles because it preserves us from sin. That verse says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And then the final bullet point there under why is because truth is a stewardship. Now, there's a number of references there from 2 Timothy. You could also look at Titus. And the general theme is that truth is a precious deposit or stewardship. Paul viewed it as something that had been revealed to him and the other apostles, entrusted to them. And Paul took it very, very seriously that his responsibility was to pass it along to a man like Timothy who was going to learn it and understand it, and then he was going to defend it and preach it, and he was going to commit it to faithful men, and they would be able to teach others also. So for us today, whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever age you are in the meeting, there's a generation that has gone before us. The Lord has used men and women out of that generation to pass the truth to us, both in terms of their lives that they've lived, the examples they've set, the conversations we've had, and in the case of men, the preaching that they have done. That truth has come to us by the providence of God. It is our responsibility to learn it, to hold it, to defend it, and to pass it on to the next generation. And those of us who are parents or grandparents, one of our great responsibilities in the stewardship of children is to Raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Like Timothy's mother and his grandmother, our children from their childhood should know the Holy Scriptures. So that's a number of reasons why. In terms of who, this is not in order of ranking of priority, but it is important for men speaking publicly and teaching the truth. And so I think for the men who are here and for those who's, who are wives of men that do take public part, It is very important that we understand and study the Bible if we are going to be handling it publicly. It's not enough to just do a quick Google search for famous sermons and then try to claim it as your own and get up and deliver it. You do need to study your Bible if you are going to be used to speak and communicate and teach truth. Uh, The verse there from 1 Peter, if any man speak, he should speak as the oracles of God. It's a serious thing. I could stand in a business setting and give a you know, a seminar on, I don't know if I'm qualified to give one or not, but, you know, try to give a seminar on motivating staff or uh, dealing with management theory or whatever. And I can tell you honestly, somebody asked a while ago, was there a difference between studying your Bible, studying other things, or preaching versus a public presentation? I'll tell you this difference. Is I used to work for the Ontario government at one time, the province where we live, and made presentations to Treasury Board and Cabinet. And if you knew your material and you studied it up, and you knew the policy implications of what was being proposed, and you knew your audience, the premier and the cabinet ministers, very little could ever go wrong. Basically, you you knew your material, and you presented it, and it was just sort of academic. It was just stuff that you were presenting. Preaching's not like that. You know, there's times with preaching that you think you're well prepared, and you get up there, and it's like you're running uphill in mud with work boots on. Like, you just can't seem to get anywhere. Because there is a spiritual dimension to communicating spiritual truth, which is very different. Sometimes it's to do with your own maybe carnal condition. Sometimes it's to do with pride. Sometimes there's a whole bunch of reasons. But spiritual truth is spiritually discerned and it's spiritually communicated. And therefore, it is important that men who are going to be speaking publicly and teaching the truth will be men who are marked by personal study of their Bible. And that's the long-term, ongoing, you never achieve it. It's not a badge that you get someday that says, this is a man that knows his Bible now and he's qualified to speak. It's a lifelong study of the Word of God. It's important for overseers. Likely the greatest uh, biblical responsibility for overseers, repeated, is to feed the flock of God. To tend them, yes. It's more than just preaching or even oral public teaching. But it certainly includes that. 
And one of the greatest responsibilities an overseer has is to make sure that the flock entrusted to the care of the overseers is being fed spiritually. And that is going to involve knowing the scriptures and being apt to teach. It's important for all believers, male and female, not just those involved in public speaking. Why? For the reasons given above. Spiritual growth, not sinning against God, all of those are reasons that are applicable to every one of us. It is the way that God communicates to us today, is through His Word. And therefore, we all should be marked by reading and studying the Scriptures. And then I have there the last bullet point, and that'll come up in some of the questions. Examples of, in the New Testament of women who obviously had been personally devoted to the study of the Scripture. When and where, the only things I'll say on that is, you can feed in the Word of God anywhere, and I would encourage that. Uh, there are opportunities today, if you live in an area like the one I live in, there's lots of traffic, you spend a lot of time in your car, uh, maybe instead of listening to sports talk radio or some entertaining podcast or some other you know, music station or whatever, uh, it's not a bad thing to have an audio Bible. And uh, I think especially maybe for um, consecutive reading of a book like Philippians or Colossians or Ephesians, you are in the car for a period of time, it's an opportunity to listen to an entire book on a fairly short period of time during a drive and then listen to it several times. So there are ways that you can study your Bible, if you want to call it multitasking, you know, I, I, yeah, you can try to do that, but you will also have to have specific time set aside. There's not too many people get a degree in you know, engineering or accounting or biochemistry or something just by sort of doing it on the side while they're doing a lot of other stuff. You're going to understand that there is a certain amount of discipline and structure and study that is going to be required. There is the final point there, priority of getting something into your soul each morning. It may not be the time of day when you're at your best. It's not mine. Rachel is a real morning person, and I am not. <laughs> I don't know how much more nicely I can say that. But before you start your day, get something into your soul from the Word of God that you can carry with you through the day. And then finally, before I sit down, in terms of how, here we go with alliteration again, comprehensively, all Scripture. Don't just have favorite passages. And don't just approach the Word of God to say, you know, Google and say, boy, I don't feel very good today. What, what does the Word of God have for me when I'm discouraged? And you, you will get something, but all of the Scripture is inspired by God. And so there should be, at least to some degree, an appetite to comprehensively understand the Scripture. And the Scripture is a comprehensive revelation from God. It is a progressive revelation. The Old Testament actually does matter. It is significant. Much of my understanding of passages in the New Testament is predicated on a decent understanding of the Old Testament to understand quotations from the Old Testament in the context in which they're used. So comprehensively, possibly one of the most important is contextually. And we've touched on that in terms of looking at an epistle. Don't just pluck a verse, uh, valuable though that verse might be. Understand the context in which that verse was first given. The verses before, the verses after, the book where it's found. What does the verse mean in its context? What did it mean to the people who first received it and read it? So always study contextually, Christologically. Look for Christ in the Scriptures. Now, I'm not just talking in some creative, oblique way. The Scriptures actually are full of Christ. And you say, well, how can you prove that? Well, the verse I've got there, Luke chapter 24, the Lord Jesus draws alongside to two people walking on the road to Emmaus. And they're sad, and he walks with them. And he actually exhorts them, corrects them for why are they sad. But you know what it says there in Luke? It says that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them out of all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Christ is in all the scriptures. So look for him. When you're reading, when you're studying, as I mentioned in ministry, look for Christ. Carefully, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, there'll be some of the questions we'll deal with this. It's very important that we approach the study of our Bible carefully. Okay, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, I don't think, to recognize that if you took just the Christian community in its broadest sense in the way the term is used, you'll know what I mean by that. So if you take everything, including Catholicism and Protestantism, and under the great big heading of those that would claim in some way to be Christians or a Christian church, by and large, they read the same Bible. 
I know there's slight variations in Catholic Bibles and so on. I know that. But by and large, they read the same Bible. They come to dramatically different conclusions as to what they believe the Bible says and the way that they practice what they believe the Bible says. So therefore, I think it's fairly obvious that there is many, many, many ways to interpret what you think the Bible says and think that you're putting that into practice that do not align with the truth of God from the Scriptures. Brother Joseph talked about whatever the percentage was of Christians that don't think Jesus is the only way to heaven. Sounds absolutely, to use a term I've been accused of using, ludicrous. It seems foolish to think that a Christian would ever say that, but they do, right? People read the Bible and can make it say a lot of things. So therefore, in Bible study, we must learn to be careful, to rightly divide, be very selective what sources of biblical interpretation you allow into your mind. The Internet is not just an open feeding forum where you can read anything you want on any subject you want. You will open your mind to a lot of pollution. And then finally, consistently, in his law doth he meditate day and night. Bible study is not something that you pick up and then don't do for a long time and then after another conference, a big spurt and then nothing. It's the development of a lifelong habit of feeding on the Word of God and learning from it. So that's the, the introduction, the outline, a little longer than normal, uh, than intended, sorry. Now we have nine questions. My job is going to be to just read the questions. And as I say, these were sort of culminated or, or pulled together. And then one of us will take the lead on answering it, and the others may join in. So question number one is for Brother Sandy. Since sisters never take any public part, is it important for them to cultivate an ongoing interest in personal Bible study? If so, Why? Are there New Testament role models in this regard? Well, as you've already indicated, the study of the Word of God is not merely for being able to preach it or teach it, but the study of the Word of God is, first of all, a personal responsibility, as not to necessarily allude to my last message, but it is through the Word of God that I get to know what Christ is like, get to know Christ, and have a knowing of Christ, and as a result, I can become like the Lord Jesus. So personal Bible study should first of all be with a view to knowing Christ, knowing the God that I have come to know as well. And that is really the responsibility of every believer. There is, of course, this great difference that we have to be very, very aware of. Men such as we who are here with you today, we are under pressure, in a sense, to study the Word of God. We have an external pressure because we can only say the same thing so often, we can only repeat the same words frequently, and people realize they're going on fumes. We have to keep fresh in the Word of God. But a sister who does not take public part could get away with looking very, very spiritual just by keeping her mouth shut. I know a struggle, but keeping her mouth shut and dressing and appearing in the right way. No one would ever know what's going on underneath. So for a woman, a sister, to give herself to a study of the Word of God is a tremendous challenge. And if you know a sister who is spiritual and knows the Word of God, you take your hat off to that sister because she has, been, she has done it by her own personal exercise and desire. As to New Testament role models, we go back to the Old Testament. We can think of a Hannah, for example, and uh, her spirituality. But I think the prime example... I'm going to throw this out as a challenge. Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus, was likely a teenager. Now, we don't know for sure her age. In that culture of which we're speaking, women became betrothed as early as 13 years of age. But let's give her the age of 15. We'll go somewhere in between. Let's say she was 15 years of age. On the spur of the moment, extemporaneously, she raises a song of praise to God which alludes to about 12 different psalms. Now, how many of you teenage girls, or girls in your 20s, sisters in your 20s, if you had to extemporaneously compose a song of praise to God, could intelligently weave a dozen psalms into your praise? That's what Mary did. She obviously knew the scriptures. She obviously was very, very conversant and very much at home in the Word of God as a teenager. So that should be a challenge to all of us. But I'm thinking now especially of the value that it could be to young sisters to consider the fact that they 
need to be in the Word of God just as Mary. Likewise, in keeping with that, when we gather on a Lord's Day morning, a sister should come with, I'll use the word to use an old hackneyed phrase, a basket full of praise. There should be something in your heart to give to God of worship and thanksgiving for the Lord Jesus as well. And that only comes from gleaning through the week in the Word of God. And then we have other examples to point to. I think our brother has mentioned them somewhere in the outline. You think about a Priscilla who, along with her husband, could take an Apollos aside and teach him the Word of God more accurately. It wasn't just her husband, but it mentions that both of them were able to do that and to instruct him and make him a much more useful vessel in the work of God. And uh, along with those, you have the, the daughters of Philip that are spoken of in the book of the Acts, who are uh, women who were exercised in the Word of God. And then you have Eunice and Lois, Timothy's uh, mother and grandmother, who taught him the Word of God. And so we have examples in the Scripture of women who were able to handle the Word of God. Titus chapter 2. Now I know it's a much, in my mind, a much misunderstood portion of the Word of God. But there is a place for sisters in a private teaching of other sisters, of that which, is, that which would be inappropriate for especially a single man like Timothy to be teaching women about raising children, about, their hus about husband-wife relationships. And so older sisters have the responsibility to mentor younger sisters in divine principles relative to family life. Now those are just some of them. So we're talking about worship, we're talking about becoming like Christ, we're talking about, becoming, about having something to uh, offer to others, we're talking about all of these things that are incumbent and make it necessary for all of our believers, men and women alike, to be conversant in the Scriptures and to make it your goal to study the Word of God and to learn Christ, learn God, and to grow. Very good. I think the... Uh the whole mindset that Sandy has touched on this, that the only reason to study the Bible is to be prepared for some specific service, is a bit of a fatal flaw in approaching the, the discipline of studying the Bible. So as Sandy has rightly said, for men who are asked to take public part, there is an external impetus that you don't have a choice, you have to study. Although I think Sandy would agree that even for those who are, if that's the only study I do, is in response to a specific need. Boy, goodness, i got a pinch hit at Midland Park. I better come up with something to preach about. If that's the only, the only impetus to study, I'm going to be impoverished for that, and that will become fairly evident. But the Word of God is our necessary food. And it's whether you ever impart truth to someone else, whether you are ever a Priscilla, I'm speaking to sisters, whether you're ever a Priscilla who's married to an Aquila who is sitting with a young man who's a little off and you're helping in the discussion to, if that is the case, then great. But even if you're not, it's still worthwhile to read and study your Bible for all of us. We all will not develop spiritually. The Bible ultimately is our means of knowing God. And is that not a worthy enough end in itself? Like it's not just to be prepared for some act of service. It's actually how God communicates to us. And that should be enough reason for us to want to study. you have anything else on that one, Joe? No. Okay, well then we'll keep moving. The second question was one that frankly surprised me a little. It shouldn't have. So I think it's a very valid one. I'll read it. Um, I don't feel terribly qualified to answer it, but I'll attempt to. It says, I am a young Christian wife and a mother, and I feel intimidated and inferior because I don't really have a deep knowledge of the Bible, and I find the pressure to be a student very difficult. Am I a failure because I'm not a Bible student? So, it was a bit, I'll tell you, it was a bit of an eye-opener to me because the, and I, I spoke to the sister that, that said it, and she said, like, honestly, sometimes I sit in meeting and I hear them say, you know, even if you're a sister, you should be studying your Bible. Don't just read it. Don't just have a little 10-minute devotional in the morning. You've got to study it. You've got to learn it. And she said, but honestly, like I look at each week, I look at each month, and I got kids, and if I get 10 minutes in the morning to read and get something, that's basically what I get. And she said, I hear even some of the other women, and they're all saying I should be this, I should be that, and I just feel like I'm a total failure. That's pretty brutal honesty. And I would just like to say, sister, don't let, sisters or brothers, the purpose of Bible study is to know the Lord and grow spiritually. 
And then however he chooses to use that, he can choose to use it. There is a tremendous danger in Bible study. Now you'll say, what on earth? How can there be a danger in Bible study? There's a tremendous danger in Bible study because of this. Knowledge puffeth up. That's scriptural. There's a real danger for men or women to somehow think that the more I know of my Bible and the more other people know that I know of my Bible, that somehow that makes me a better Christian. And if that is the purpose, then God knows our hearts. That's, that's completely off base. No one should feel intimidated that they're not enough of a student of the Bible. No one should feel peer pressure that somehow, that's not at all the purpose of study for men or women. So I would say to, to sisters who, who wrote this, a young sister, a wife, a mother, you do need to read your Bible. You do. You will find it's very difficult to fulfill your role as a wife, as a mother, and to grow as an individual believer without some diet of the Word of God. If that's a little time in the morning to read and to study, a little bit of help, then take that and seek to grow and talk to the Lord about it, and that's fine. And maybe just finally a word to, to husbands uh, in this respect. One of the great stewardships as a husband, and the man to my right is the one that really helped me to understand this, headship is not being boss. Headship is being responsible for something and being accountable for it. And if you're a husband in this meeting, you are accountable to the Lord for the well-being of your wife and your children. And that includes their spiritual well-being. So if it means that you take the kids, it won't kill you. If it means that you do the dishes, it won't erode your masculinity. If it means that you carve out time so that your wife and your children's mother has time for her own spiritual feeding, then that would be a great use of your time. So any sister here that feels this way, don't. Please don't. Don't go away from here feeling like a failure because you're not an expert. If you can't quote one verse from each of the four chapters in Philippians, that's okay. You go home with your head held high, and if your kids are sleeping, you can look it up and get them. So, anything to add to that one? Uh, not, not really, just on the subject of sisters, since we'll be leaving it. I know from a gospel perspective, often the first contact you will meet is a woman um, and, or a family from the community. And so especially in gospel subjects, it is extremely helpful if your wife or someone knows the Bible and can explain gospel truth rather than the man. It's just very difficult uh, from a practical standpoint. So I know we're kind of moving a little bit, but if, if your wife can explain atonement, that is extremely helpful. And so for whatever that's worth. Yeah, the only other thing I would mention, uh, along with your excellent comments, Andrew, the Lord knows your circumstances. We do not have a hard taskmaster who requires you to study an hour a day, and if you don't, you're somehow demoted in Christian living. He understands your circumstances. And if all you can legitimately spare from all the demands made on you during the course of a day with a family is 15 minutes, it's amazing what the Lord can give you in 15 minutes in comparison to some of us that have a lot of time on our hands that could spend an hour. So, number one, don't despair. Number two, learn to use the events of life as windows into the heart of God. This may sound very simplistic, but as you're caring for your child, as you're showing love to a child who does not, because of being an infant, is not able to reciprocate your love, that should be a window into the heart of God that he loves despite our failure to return love. So all of life's events should become windows for us to appreciate God in deeper and more, more precious ways. Very good. Now, there's a lot more could be said on that, but we will run out of time. So we'll keep moving. Number three, Joseph will uh, attempt to answer initially, does it matter what English Bible version I use for personal Bible study? Yes. <laughs> Okay, okay, moving so, on to question yeah. four. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just underline something, at least from the part of the country I come from. This is a very emotive question. The, notice the question. Not public meetings, personal Bible study. That's the question. What translation, or does it matter which translation I use for personal Bible study? Um, again, we can't spend the whole meeting on this. There's excellent material David Valens has put out many, many things in Truth and Tidings on, on this subject. There are two basically kinds of translations. There's a word-for-word -word translation that even then goes into 
making some exceptions. We're talking now English. Then there's a translation that's thought for thought. A good word for word translation, like you're going to find out now what I think textually, and if you disagree with me, we can talk about that after. I like the NASB as a good word for word translation. New King James, ESV, King James Version. As far as good thought for thought translations, this is almost in my mind like a bridge between the Bible and a commentary. It's not quite a commentary, but it, it helps you. I think the NET is excellent. Um, the NIV, hang me later, but the NIV has some good help on helping for Bible study. I think it's good, like you've said, brother, to keep in mind the aim. The aim is to know what God has said. And so every possible tool should be used. Like, like the proverb says here, I have it open here, if you seek for me as for silver. So if, if you can imagine like a treasure chest in this book, I will use whatever whatever I can use to get to it. And I'm not going to say, well, so-and-so doesn't want to use it. If I can get to the meaning of this book through whatever means, whatever translation, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to use that. Now, I would say that a, a couple things. Um, just know what you're getting. Know that when you have a thought-for-thought thought translation, what the person has done is given you really their interpretation. They're telling you what they think the text means. Okay, so know that it's not, you know, because we do believe in the plenary or the word, word for word inspiration of the word of God, that God superintended every single word that was written down originally. And that's again an, an issue and we're just dealing with an English translation. Mm-hmm. Um, so know what you're getting if you do the thought for thought, but I would have them both. Um, I think the NASB is excellent. I think even though, even if you do a word for word translation, watch some of, this, some of the notes. The new NASB that's been put out has a very high leaning in one doctrinal position, the one just put out. So watch the notes. It could be an excellent translation, but the notes maybe wouldn't be helpful. So again, personally, I try to get a Bible that doesn't have notes when I'm studying. But go ahead. No, I think that's very helpful. Um, the, uh, the fact that we have a fairly large number of English translations. Some feel that's a very bad thing because it uh, causes tremendous confusion. Uh, My own view, whether it's a good or a bad thing, is somewhat irrelevant. It's a fact. So we have a large number of English translations. Uh, We also do, though, have the ability to fairly quickly discern uh, how those translations were developed, what principles they're based on, and how reliable they are. So I would really support what Joseph has said. Um, I don't believe, and We're not here to condemn the King James Version nor promote it as the only valid uh, source of Bible study. I don't think it's necessary to do gymnastics to understand the English of a specific era in order to study your Bible. But if you want a simpler English language Bible to understand, uh, do be cautious. They're not all the same. And I think some of the ones that Joseph has recommended are valid to use as your main text. And then you can read some others just, just I mean, some people don't really totally grasp the whole thing about word for word, thought for thought, and I'm not being critical, Joseph, you know that, but it's, you'll come across terms like uh, formal equivalence or dynamic equivalence, which is underlying the way Joseph's described it. Uh, a translator has to take the original language uh, and then try to put into a receptor language, a different language, what the original text said. So a formal equivalence or a word-for-word translation, it's still, none of them literally are word-for-word because it's impossible pretty well to take one language and translate every word and string them together in the same order. It won't read as a logical sentence in the receptor language. But formal equivalence says you try as much as possible to capture the words, making only whatever changes are necessary to read acceptably in the receptor language. Uh, whereas a, a, a dynamic equivalent or that type of translation, it's more, let's capture the thought. What did the writer mean to communicate? What did the original readers understand the writer communicating in that language? And let's capture that as best we can in the receptor language. Uh, there's nothing evil about either one. Um, but if there is a leaning, and again, I'll, I'll sort of put my, I was going to say cards on the table. That's a very bad metaphor. I, <laughs> going to put my preference out there. Dynamic. Uh, is, that's right. <laughs> I'll put my preference out there. I would suggest for Bible study that you, if you're going to make this a discipline habitually, 
I would suggest that you lean towards a formal equivalent type translation. Let the Word of God say what God originally said. And if that means that you're going to have to do a little digging and work to understand what it means, do the digging and do the work. Let me give you a practical example. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Are safe. That's what it says. A dynamic equivalent translation would likely say, well, or might say, a strong tower meant something in the days when the people first read that because there were you know, armies chasing you and you could go into a strong tower and you would be safe. It was a place of refuge, a place of protection. But we don't have strong towers today. So for people to understand what it means, we'll say that uh, the name of the Lord is a place of safety. The name of the Lord is a place of refuge to capture the thought. My advice would be, let it say the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And then you do the little bit of digging to understand what does it mean, a strong tower? And you'll understand in the culture of the day that's what it meant. So let the Word of God say what God actually said, and then you do the digging to try to understand what it means. But in general, there's many good choices you can have for Bible study, and definitely would not say you've got to pick one, and that's the only. There is no inspired English translation, okay? So the Apostle Paul did not write in King James English. As sacrilegious as that might sound, he didn't. He wrote in Greek. So, okay, we'll move along. Question number four is for Sandy. Can you please outline some key principles of interpretation that should guide me in my personal Bible study? This could take really the entire hour if we were to do it in, in any depth. Fortunately, our brother Andrew has, through his ministry, given us some key guidelines and some help concerning this already. First of all, context is probably the single most important matter when it comes to interpretation. The context. First of all, bear with me here, is the, co the context of the Old Testament versus the New Testament. The Old Testament is written for us, but not about us. So to go to the Old Testament take some statement out and name it and claim it has tremendous danger because it wasn't addressed to you, it was addressed to Israel. The New Testament is written for us, but even there, context will be important. So Old Testament versus New Testament. Then you've got to ask yourself as well, context as far as the time it was written. For example, early in the, early in the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ says, go not to the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's Matthew, I think, Matthew 10. You come to Matthew 28, he says, go into all the world. So, so there is a, a development in terms of the context and principles that are being given to us. So you've got to also get an idea where this fits in the timeline of events in the New Testament. Then, the context in the chapter. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul suggests that everyone remain as he is. That is not very good for Sunday school. It dries up family life pretty quickly. But you've got to, again, understand the context, the time of persecution, the time of difficulty, and so other things that are involved in that chapter. He's not legislating. He's dealing with a particular situation. So the context of the chapter, and then even the context of an entire sentence. Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. Really? Really? The Lord delighted to hear that Lazarus was dead. Lazarus is dead and I am glad that for your sakes I was not there, to the intent you may believe. So you've got to read the whole portion, the whole, the whole sentence, the whole chapter, and more importantly, perhaps the entire epistle or the entire letter. So along with context comes the, the concept, if I can call it that, of consecutive reading to get to the big picture. Andrew already hinted at this or maybe even said it, and I just viewed it as a hint don't pick and choose a chapter every day that you feel you need. I'm depressed today, so I better read this chapter. Or I need guidance today, so I'll read a chapter that talks about the Lord is my light. And... No. Picking and choosing robs you of the context in which a chapter occurs that enables you to see the broader picture and the thought flow, to borrow the words of an esteemed man who's now in heaven, you get to see the thought flow through the entire section and now can begin to understand verses in their context in a far, far more accurate way. So context, consecutive reading is also very are important for us. Does what I am reading bear out 
the truth of the rest of Scripture? Or is I, am I seeing something in this verse that really is totally foreign to what everything else the Bible teaches? Never interpret a difficult Scripture by denying obvious Scriptures. Now, I hope that isn't too obtuse. Don't interpret something that violates the clear meaning of other Scriptures. Rather, the clear meaning of other Scriptures should help you understand something which is not quite so clear and quite so obvious. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Of that day and that hour knoweth no man, not the Son. Well, now, wait a minute. I thought He was deity. How could He not know something? And so you immediately begin to think, well, maybe He's not the Son of God. But you've got multitudes of other Scriptures which substantiate His deity and His sonship. So I don't come to this difficult Scripture and say, well... It must mean this, and I've got to throw these other dozen scriptures away. The difficult should always be interpreted in light of the obvious and the clear. Now, those are just some things. Now, along with what our brother has already given you in his outline, and since he has gone to the trouble of doing it with alliteration, I'm going to suggest two other things here in this section. Number one is reading consecutively, which I've also already mentioned. Pick a book and read it backwards and forwards a dozen times. Remember reading once in Truth and Tidings, and Tom Bentley was, Mr. Tom Bentley was talking about Bible study, and he said to read it 11 times. I began wondering, why 11 times? Well, of course, it was just to get your attention. Uh, if he had said five, you would have just rounded it off to one. But saying 11 <laughs> kind of drew your attention. I've got to really do this. So read, read it back and forth many, many times to get the entire picture of the chapter. Read it comprehensively, as he said, consecutively, contextually, Christologically, carefully, consistently. One other one. And I think this has the warrant of the Word of God. Read it confidently. You may say confidently. I thought Christians had no confidence. No confidence in yourself. Confident that God actually wants to speak to me through this book. It's not a, it's not a, a maze. You know, God didn't put you in a, a maze like a rat to try to find your way. And uh, if you're really good, you'll get the cheese at the end. But if not, you know, you're going to be stuck in the maze forever. God wants to reveal himself to you. He's, he's trying to make it as plain as he can. So come to the Word of God with confidence that the Spirit of God wants to reveal Christ to my soul. I tell the young Christians, do four things when you come to any chapter of the Bible. If you do these four things, I don't want to say I'll guarantee, but I would almost guarantee you'll not leave empty. Number one, what can I learn about God from this section of the Word of God? What is my God like? Now you think of the Psalms, think of Scriptures, that they reveal to you something of the character of God. What is God like? Can I see Christ in this passage in any possible way? Is He here in picture, contrast, type, and so on? Thirdly, is there anything the Spirit of God is answering in terms of my prayer life or my, my burdens? You're coming to God with your requests, your burdens, your concerns. How's He going to answer you? He doesn't, you know, he doesn't send drones down with messages. He speaks to His Word. So is the Spirit of God answering anything that I have been praying about and concerned about. So, learning of God, looking for Christ, listening for the Spirit. Is there anything I need to live out that I've read today? Anything I can put into my life in terms of living out day to day? And virtually those four questions, now this is just more, this isn't so much study, this is more just coming to the Word of God to get something for your soul. Those things will always give you something to feed upon. But in this broad picture, as I, I got to that, to the, the idea of having confidence that God wants to speak, wants to reveal, wants to convey to you what is in his heart, and wants you to grow as a Christian. Now, we could go into other things in terms of uh, approaching the Word of God like we would approach a forest. How much time do I have? Because I don't want to intrude. No, go ahead. You know, you, you look at a forest, you see the trees. And then you want to hone in on a particular part of the forest. Then you want to look at one particular tree. Then you want to look at the leaves on that tree. Then you want to start looking under the leaves for what you... It's the idea of coming to the, the Word of God. Get the big picture. Begin to hone down gradually, as our brother has done, all the way down to words and phrases and terms, and begin to follow them through the, through the particular epistle you're in. And then comparing it with other epistles. Comparing the, the Word of God. And I'll just end with this, and other, others can come in here. You have a tremendous advantage that I did not have when I began studying the Word of God. And that is you have a computer you can keep notes on. I have notebooks at home, and 
they're just going to go in the dustbin someday because who's going to bother looking at a notebook, okay? I've even stopped looking at my notebooks. You can keep everything on your computer, and it has the tremendous advantage, unlike those of us who are older, they keep our notes in our Bible. Uh, when you change your mind, you don't have to erase or try to cover it up so nobody knows how stupid you once were that you thought that, okay? You can just hit the delete button, and that particular statement is gone, and you end. So what, what I have done, just a suggestion, make a folder for every book in the Bible. Make a subfolder for every chapter of every book in the Bible. And as you are studying, enter your notes. And you will find over the course of your life, as you are studying books for the Bible reading in your assembly or studying on your own, whatever it may be, you will find your knowledge will begin to accumulate over the period of time and you'll begin to appreciate the truth of God in a far better way. Keep notes when you're studying. Don't depend upon your memory, especially as you go older, it gets very, very selective and leaky. So make notes that you can go back to and build upon and your knowledge of the Word of God will grow as a result. Do you want to say something Excellent. about com sure. computer helps? Uh, that's one of the later questions. Okay. We'll, we'll deal okay. in a few minutes with more specific sort of very practical suggestions on computer, um, online and computer-based apps that can help. Um, the one, to just add to what Sandy has said before we go to the next question, and that is, he, he said this, but he said it quickly in, in passing. Approach the Word of God the way you would approach anything that you're reading as at face value it's telling you the truth. <clears throat> In other words, accept the plain meaning of a passage of Scripture unless there's some compelling reason to do otherwise. You know, Philip, for example, if you're reading, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Probably you should view that as poetic language. It's, you're not likely to mount up with wings like an eagle. So obviously, you know, it wouldn't make any sense. But there's a real danger today. Why is it that so many people can claim that Jesus isn't the only way. When you read the Bible, and it seems very obvious that he is. Why is it that people can claim that the Bible actually doesn't have anything to say about abortion? It's nothing to do with whether life begins in the womb or not. When you read passages, and it seems quite clearly that the Bible says that the Lord knew me when I was in the womb, and the passages like that. Well, it's because of the way they approach the reading of the Bible. So they will approach passages like that and say it's essentially just poetry. It's like a, a work of literature. It can mean different things to different people. And each different view is, is valid. And you can have your truth and I can have my truth. No, this is God's truth. And it's not so much what does this passage mean to me. Yeah, it's not good. It's what does this passage mean. Period. What does this passage mean? So when you approach the Word of God, read it literally, understand it plainly, if at all possible. And then if it, contextually there's some reason why... You, you, you come to understand, as Sandy says, based on you know, general, obvious truth, this passage can't mean what it seems to say. It must mean something different. Those will be the exceptions, not the norm. So approach the Word of God simply to mean what it says. Okay, we'll move to the next question because uh, time's going. I've heard the terms exegesis and eisegesis. Maybe you haven't heard those terms. But if you have heard those terms used relative to Bible study. What do the terms mean, and why are they important? And Joseph's going to tackle that. The first thing I would say is uh, don't be afraid of the terms. I think sometimes in our, our circles, if I can use that phrase, we have almost spiritualized uh, relative ignorance of these kind of terms. We are happy mm -hmm. without using the word theology. We are happy that we don't know what eschatology means. Well, everyone knows what QBR means. Everyone knows what a safety does in a football game. Everyone knows what the corner does, the linebacker does, the defensive end does. But exegesis, well, we're too spiritual to know that. No. Exegesis, you need to know. And what it means is to bring out of the text. Jesus is the idea. It comes from the word behind interpretation. Ex, out of. Ice, into. That's two Greek words. There you go. Into the text out of the text. One of them, exegesis, means to bring the interpretation out of the text. Eisegesis means to read the interpretation into the text. Now this will come and dovetail right into what Mr. Higgins has been saying. Context. I am eisegeting, 
uh, passage. I am reading the interpretation into the text when I ignore the context. So I come to, let's look at the positive. Exegesis means I'm looking at the text. I look at my Bible. I see what it says. Now, that's actually very hard to do. It's very hard to actually look at what the Bible actually says because we all come to it with our own. So look at the text. Then look at who it is being said to. That's been brought up a number of times. How it is being said, the genre, right? Ecclesiastes is not the same as Romans. Look at how it's being said, why it's being said. That's exegesis. Then you bring out of the text what it then means. Eisegesis is ignoring all of it. I don't care how it was said. I don't care about the genre. I don't care about who said it. I don't care who it's, it's said to. That text means there's many ways to have it. And there we are with, you know, many of the errors, if not all the errors, are verses taken out of context. It actually was a form of um, understanding of even just general literature that was introduced about a decade ago into universities where when an author was done writing, basically that was it. His hands were off it. Now you decided what it meant, how it made you feel. So there wasn't really a meaning to what he was writing. It was rather... I would decide by how I felt when I read it what it really meant. That has crept into evangelical circles as well, where we now come to the Word of God, and what does it do to me? How does it make me feel? So I become the interpreter of the Word of God, rather than the Spirit of God interpreting it from the text. And our brethren have been emphasizing the need of understanding the Word of God as God meant it to be understood. Can I just ask you guys, uh, brethren, a question? Um, one of the things we often face is, well, you can never know, like, it means what, it, what I think it means, kind of what you're saying. How do we know that it's not just our interpretation? And maybe you're going to get to this later, I'm not sure. How do we know that there is, like, are there many interpretations to a verse? Are there many meanings? Um, what do you have to say on that? Kind of, I think, in the same. I would suggest that there usually is one interpretation of a verse, but there could be several applications of that verse, especially if the verse happens to be a principle, and we'll come to that a little bit later. But the Word of God usually has one interpretation. How can we be sure if we have come to the right interpretation? That is a very important question, and it, it, should, not be a, it should not be something which breeds pride in us. I have to ask myself, is this consistent with the character of God? Is this consistent with the re remainder of Scripture? Is this consistent with the theme of this book? Is this consistent with the context in which I have found it? And if I can go through those four hurdles, and maybe you can add a few more, then there is very, very strong likelihood that I am on the right track with the interpretation. Do you want to add to that? No, I think that's, that's good. It's a very valid question. We will touch on it a little bit. Um, so the next question I got was, can you give some practical advice on how to approach the study of a specific Bible book? For example, a New Testament epistle. Now, for those that were here yesterday, you'll know that I sort of stressed that the, the bulk of the New Testament, the middle of it, five history books, one prophecy at the end, and then 21 books in the middle are all letters. They're all epistles. So I'll just touch a little bit on that. Uh, obviously, there's books... Uh, the historical books, Matthew has 28 chapters. There's books in the Old Testament that have, you know, a tremendous amount of material, and this might not be as simple. But if we take a New Testament epistle, now these are just practical suggestions. This is absolutely not uh, mandatory by any means. But just some suggestions that either I have found helpful or people that I have a lot of respect for have found helpful. With an epistle, read it through. I have a very good friend. I won't use his name, but I have a very good friend who I really respect in terms of his Bible study and his approach, he attempts to do one epistle a month. And he'll spend the first 10 days of the month reading the epistle numerous times, as Sandy has said. Read the entire epistle. Now, Sandy said read it forwards and backwards. I don't think he reads it backwards, but that would be interesting to do. But he reads it multiple times uh, before he looks up any studies or any helps. Read the whole epistle. And after the fourth or fifth time through it, start looking, as I suggested this afternoon, start looking for themes and trends and things that are re repeated. Not just a, now you'll say, yeah, but I could just Google that right away. Yeah, you could. You could just say, how many times is joy found in Philippians? And you'll get the answer like that. 
But you won't get the way that the word is being used over and over in the sentences in the, in the chapter, in the letter. So read it through, look for things that are repeated, and then look for the basic flow of the argument in the book. Now you can look up outlines again. You can go in concordance, you can find an outline, and you'll have multiple ways of breaking the book up, and you'll get to that. But before you get to that, just read it as though this was a letter, as you were sitting in the original assembly that this came to, or you were one of the recipients that got a copy of this letter read. <coughs> How would you understand it? Follow the flow of the argument. Your brother Joe read two passages today from Ephesians 4 and Colossians 1. Read them. They're long, especially Ephesians and Colossians. You talk about run-on sentences. Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, the massively long, 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 long sentences. But follow them. Follow them. Follow the argument. What's the apostle saying? And you'll understand yourself more than if you simply just initially, immediately go to a commentary and start reading it. So I would suggest start with reading a letter multiple times. Look for common words. Look for common themes. Follow the argument of the epistle. And then just to follow up on one thing that Sandy said is make notes and keep notes. Now, you can do that in Bible software. Logos or other Bible software programs allow you to keep your notes, actually cross-reference two specific passages. Um, so that's great. Mr. Jim Allen, who's uh, very, very well along in age now, but still alive, and one of the most brilliant Bible students I've personally had the privilege of knowing, he stayed in our home by now. It's probably 20 years ago. The kids were small. <coughs> and I remember at the time him saying to me, he said, Andrew, as you study, make notes of what you're studying. He wasn't saying this in a proud sense. He said, all of my life I've studied my Bible, and the Lord gave me a keen mind. And he did. He wasn't bragging. He said, all my life I've studied my Bible, and the Lord gave me a keen mind. But I'm getting to a stage in my life now where I wish I had written down the things that I studied years ago, because I could for recall them through memory for years. And he says, now I just don't seem to have it as quickly as I used to, and I never wrote it down. So make notes, keep notes. And then I would say almost as a, a, a you know, well down the road, third or fourth step, then get a good reliable commentary and look it up and see gaps that you maybe missed and things that need to be filled in. But that would be my practical advice of how to study. There's 21 letters in the New Testament. You take that approach with 21 letters, and you'll actually find that your understanding of those begins to really grow. And then as it does, if you start with letter number one, you'll do letter number one. When you do letter number two, three, four, and five, you'll then start to be able to compare that across. And as you compare it across, you can look at, were they written at similar times, similar circumstances? Why were they written? Ephesians and Colossians, very parallel letters, slightly different. And it'll open up a whole new field of study for you. It's an exciting study. I mean, I don't know if any of you are excited students. I wasn't particularly. I think university comes at a terrible time in life because it's sort of this drudgery you have to get through. If I could go back to business school now, having worked in the business field for a while, it would actually all kind of make sense. But at the time when you first take it, it doesn't. Like, childhood is wasted on the young. But it's actually a very exciting thing to study the Bible and see those connections coming together for yourself. Can I just add one anecdote? Uh, some will know the name of Jim Flanagan. He was a very, very esteemed servant of the Lord in Northern Ireland. There are a number of books he wrote that are part of what the Bible teaches series. His 35th birthday, they were having a, a get-together, a party for him on his 35th birthday. Someone came up to him and said, congratulations, you're now, you've now reached middle age. And it stunned him to think, middle age, he's right. We're only, we're only promised 70 years at, and so on. So he thought, I've got 35 years left of my life possibly. He said, let me think, there are 66 books in the Bible. I have 35 years left. That's two books a year for me to study in depth. And that's what he did. And of course, he lived beyond that, but the, the profit of it was obvious to all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, we're going to have to keep moving here. This next one's a very important one. Sandy will tackle it, but it's a bit lengthy, but it's a very fair question. What is the difference between precepts, principles, practices, and precedents? Now, those are all in quotes. So, precepts, principles, practices, and precedents. When I study a Bible passage, how do I know if the writer is only referring to a specific situation in the immediate context, culturally, geographically, historically, or whatever? 
or if the teaching being given applies to me today. For example, why do we not literally wash one another's feet? John 13 and 14, the Lord says, if I've washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. And yet we do literally practice covered and uncovered heads in assembly meetings. 1 Corinthians 11. First of all, uh, precepts, principles, practices, precedents, and so on. Precepts are clear commands of the New Testament. For example, just to mention a couple that you have in Ephesians 4 since it's been mentioned. Um, Let him that stole steal no more. Then as well, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which, is, that which is good to the use of edifying. Lie not one to another, and so on. Those are clear commands. First Thessalonians chapter 4, relative to moral living, clear precepts. They do not allow any wiggle room, if I can use that expression for interpretation. They're as clear as can be. You can't get around them. When it says don't lie, it means exactly that. When it says, do not commit fornication, it means exactly that. So, precepts are clear commands that are found in our New Testament that we are to live out. Principle, now, having said that, behind every precept is a principle. But, there are principles of the Word of God that stand on their own as well. For example, we, we, we read here, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work let him labor working with his hands, the thing that is good. Does that mean I literally must work with my hands? Or does it simply mean that we all should have a job and work to provide? Likewise, for example, holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Holy and reverent in his name. The principle of reverence is taught throughout the word of God. How I express reverence will depend on how I apply that principle to my own life. For example, I grew up, I know you've all heard me say this before, I grew up in an era where reverence meant you only wore a white shirt on Sunday. You only wore black shoes, sorry, only wore black shoes, not brown shoes. Those were all, they're, they're, I know we all have on brown shoes right now. <laughs> See how far we've fallen. <laughs> but they were applying that principle in that particular way. Now, the problem comes when you take a precept and try to make it a principle, you're now taking liberty with the Word of God. When you take a, a principle and try to make it a precept, you have now fallen into legalism. You must wear a white shirt. You must wear black shoes. Because I interpret this principle in this way in my life, you must as well. So while we're, when we're dealing with principles, we have to recognize that you and I may apply it in a different way. Having said that, because there's a difference, don't just ignore it altogether and say, well, what's the use? I mean, we can just forget about principles. Make sure you show reverence in some way when you are among the people of God in, in, in assembly gatherings. Make sure you show love one to another in the way that God has impressed it upon your heart to show love one to another. So precepts are clear, unmistakable commands that leave no room for personal application. Principles, on the other hand, are guidelines for general living that we need exercise how to apply them in our lives that will bring glory to God. Now, the other one was um, practices. We see practices in the New Testament, meaning things that occur repetitively, and from those we need tremendous discernment to know, how does this apply to me? Now, for example, Acts chapter 2, we read there that they sold what they had, and they gave to everyone according to their need. And even socialists go to Acts chapter 2 to say Christianity began as a, a form of socialism. But then you come later in the book of the Acts and you find people had their own hired homes, or had their own homes. And you find as well that when uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira sold their land and tried to deceive the apostles about the fact that they sold it, Peter said it was yours, you didn't have to sell it. So that idea of socialistic living, of communal living, that we sell everything and give to everybody else, that was to meet an emergency in Acts chapter 2. It wasn't something that continued through the book. So that practice was uniquely for that particular time. Now, also, let's take the practice of remembering the Lord. Acts chapter 20 is the only reference we have as, as such that the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. 
1 Corinthians 16 tells us as well, when you are come together on the first day of the week. So we have a, a practice given to us in the book of the Acts. We have, it follow, we have a follow-up on it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So we would gather then that the first day of the week, while we don't have a mandate as such, we have a pattern. Now the challenge comes, is the book of the Acts descriptive or prescriptive? Now, descriptive just means it's just describing what they did. That's what they did then. We can do what we want to now. If it's prescriptive, intelligently understood, then it's giving us a pattern to how assembly should function even today. And as we follow patterns through the book of the Acts into the epistles, we find that many, many times the practices seen in the book of the Acts are then confirmed for us in the epistles by the writing of Paul and Peter and John and so on. Did you have more you wanted to add? That's, that's a huge subject to try to... Okay. No, it is. Okay. I let think... Me, I mean, let, me, let me answer 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Yep. So we yep. do that. Some will say 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the head covering for the woman. They'll tell you that in, that, in those days, in the uh, idols' temples in the city of Corinth, the prostitutes had uncovered heads. And so to distinguish the sisters in the assembly from the prostitutes of the city, the woman should have her head covered. So now, since we're no longer in Corinth, and that no longer is part of our society, sisters no longer have to have their heads covered. Sounds good on the surface. Problem is, that's not what Paul says. You search in vain for Paul saying anything about the city of Corinth and its culture, anything about the idol's temple. He grounds everything in creation and creation order. He doesn't ground it in the fact that there were prostitutes in the city that walked around with uncovered heads. He grounds it in a creatorial order, in a redemptive order, and in the great truth of the headship of Christ. So the ground for what we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is not cultural, not historic, but rather biblical, scriptural, going all the way back to creation, going to the headship of Christ. So there's a principle involved, the headship of Christ, there's a pattern seen, and there are precepts then that are, that are given in that chapter that we need to follow. I think that's excellent, and we don't have time to, to delve into it much further, but the purpose really is to, I think, communicate a caution. I talked at the very beginning about rightly dividing the word of truth, carefully studying your Bible. Um, and again, obviously, there are numerous churches around that do not break bread the first day of every week. There are numerous churches around that do not have uncovered heads of men and covered heads of women, dual a requirement, if you will, or a dual method, both are necessary to display the truth of 1 Corinthians 11. They read the same Bible. So they read it in a different way. And I'm only putting that out as a caution. We're not sitting in criticism of others. But the way that you approach the reading of your Bible is going to determine the interpretation. I don't mean your interpretation, the interpretation of the Scriptures. And that's why it is important. Allowing the scriptures to say what they say in their meaning, in their context. The whole idea of precedent, following the pattern of the practices of the early church. Uh, if you don't take that approach, if you say that's not important, it's just descriptive, that's just a historical narrative, and we're sort of free in our own cultural context to apply it. We don't have to be disrespectful if we differ on that. But we are not going to be able to agree. We're going to come to different conclusions. We can't pretend it's the same. You know, you think it's just cultural. I think it's uh, actually universal, meant to apply to all churches. But we'll just sort of agree to have different views on that. No, at, at some point you actually can't. People who are gathered in a certain way are going to have to agree. I stress this in unity in, in, Philippians, in Philippians chapter 1, 2, and 4. You're going to have to agree on the way that you understand the Bible. And so that's sort of the purpose of that question. I think Sandy's answered it. Now, we've got two minutes at the end. We're going to skip right to the last question. Just before we do, one important thing I wanted to say. Sandy, if the day ever comes that you and your dear wife have Bibles, notes, or any other relics that you're looking to get rid of, I know a home in Wyckoff, New Jersey, that would dearly <laughs> love to expand to a second chest specifically for the Sandy Higgins exhibit. So David and Colleen will be happy to take whatever. Colleen's shaking her head, saying, Andrew, Colleen's please. trying to get rid of things. Please, no, not another cabinet of relics. But, okay, final question going to uh, Joseph. Please provide some practical tips 
on useful Bible study software, books, websites, etc. for Bible study, as well as tips for note-taking, storing study material, saving my notes, etc. Okay, 60 seconds or less. I'll just add, just the question in the previous one, wash one another's feet. In, in oh. case that was an actual question, remember it was the Lord Jesus who metaphorically, right, you are already washed. So we're not taking liberties with that, but I, yeah. I think okay. everyone knows Thanks. that. Thanks. Moving on to where to store, I actually would not be the best as far as software. Accordance, for those who delve in the original languages, which, by the way, it is so available today, there's really no excuse for a serious Bible student not to get involved. It is so available to have access to the original language. It's right there. Like, you could talk about when you had to buy the big textbook and find it. I mean, it's right there. You just click a button and you have the Greek word. So BDAG and all of those are available on Accordance, Logos you already mentioned, eSword some people like. Uh, Note-taking systems I think are very helpful. Sandy's already mentioned like having folders. I think OneNote is a great service, Evernote, um, Bible Hub I use. Um, what I really do is rather old-fashioned. If I'm studying a passage, I write it all out without the divisions, without the verses, without the chapters. And then I mark it up like crazy. But then I don't, I don't want to lose that, so I take a little picture of it. And then you can convert that picture right on your smartphone to a PDF, <laughs> upload it to your folder, and then you can throw it away and you have it saved. Now, don't, if you don't do that, don't do that, but that really helps me. Because I can't, uh, I don't know if it's a tactile thing, I can't study on my like Kindle or something like that. Some people can't. So, I don't know what else to say on that. Yeah. I made it in time, so that's yeah. all that matters. No, I think that's fair. Uh, one, one resource that was sent to me by someone that I uh, asked about this subject, and I found it quite helpful. There's a, it's about a 10 or 15 page little study suggestion thing. It was put together by Stephen Grant. Um, and I spoke to Stephen. It's not you know, proprietary or anything. But if anyone's interested in it, email me and I'm happy to send it along to you. It gives a fairly good explanation in simple layman's kind of terms of how to approach a study of an epistle. Breaks it down into sort of the three stages of inquiry, interpretation, and application. And that's all been touched on up here today, where the first few times you read through it, it's just inquiry. What, who, when, where, why? What's, who, who wrote it? Who was it written to? Why was it written? Ask questions of the text and read. Just read through it to get answers. Inquiry. And then interpretation is then understanding in its original context. Who it was written by, who it was written to, when was it written, why was it written? What does it mean? Not what does it mean to me. What does it mean? What is the interpretation of what's being written here? And then application is saying, you know, even though if it wasn't written to me, if I understand its original interpretation, then I'll be able to apply it. So breaking it down into inquiry, interpretation, application, and there's some helpful tips and guides in there. And if you wanted to take that and use that for the study of one New Testament epistle, it would be a good place to start. If I can ask one question at conclusion, I know we're out of time, uh, but the next speaker doesn't care too much. So if I can ask one, uh, one question, um, because I think for many young Christians, the question now is, how do I get started? Because a lot of good information, but, and how do you get started into Bible study? I know so many young Christians who have bought every edition of Newberry's Bible and all the commentaries. And loads of money have been spent, and loads of micron pens have been bought, and no study has been done. How do we get moving? How do I get started? I would say get started. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I, which is not unique to Bible study, but it's, uh, one of the big follies often is you think if you buy the right software, suddenly it's going to open brand new doors. I remember in our business at one point, I thought AutoCAD was it. You know, I would buy AutoCAD. I spent $1,800 buying a version of AutoCAD. I still can't draw a rectangle. Like, it just never actually worked. When I turned maybe 40, it was, I don't know, 50, I forget. Uh, a friend of mine bought me a version of Logos Bible software, and, you know, everybody swore by Logos. If you're a serious Bible student online, you're an information age, you've got to use Logos. I never got past the introductory screen. It's just, I don't know, I'm, it's, I'm dumb. I'm old. I don't know the answer. <laughs> So it really doesn't lie in the magic of some software or some study Bible or, you know, go home and go on Christian book distributors and spend $400 to build your library and get started. Honestly, it, it starts with getting started. So if, if you're here and you would really like to get started with Bible study, pick a book. And if you don't know which one to pick, ask Sandy or, or me or Joseph. We'll tell you. I mean, just pick a good New Testament book and do what we've suggested. If you want this little simplified thing, I'll email it to you. But just get started. 
don't go to the internet and just Google some Bible study guide from somebody you've never heard of. One little principle at the very, very end that I'll mention. I read it quickly in 2 Timothy. Paul said to Timothy, continue thou in the things that thou hast learned. Listen to this clause. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Very important to be cautious the sources you go to for Bible study. Because there's a tremendous amount of material and study material available whose doctrinal underpinning is not going to lead you to an accurate understanding of the Word of God. So if you need guidance and help as to where some reliable sources would lie, ask, and you can certainly give you that. But all of the sources and software, and I can't think of any other S's uh, in the world, won't substitute for just getting started. Just start and work your way through.